Good evening, everyone. Uh, those of you who are, came in earlier, uh, you saw you have a glimpse of our magazine, which we will be distributing from tomorrow onwards. Uh, and the other souvenirs, the rosary and uh, uh, holy water will be given to everyone. Uh, those of you who are not attending Mass, don't worry. Uh, we will give until we finish. So that means maybe the whole month we'll be giving. And if you wish, you also can come and collect the souvenirs, everything. Uh, in the morning, from Monday to Saturday, 10 to 12. And uh, on the weekend, just before Mass. Okay, So if you wish to collect, uh, you can do it later. But anyway, like I say, I think we should have more than enough. Last night, we had some technical problem, uh, those who are watching on YouTube. Uh, it was a cut off and it, I think I was told that you only half an hour and got cut off. So in case you experience any technical problem again, uh, what you can do is go to our website and log in into Zoom. Our Zoom can take 500 people, so it should be more than enough. So this evening, uh, we are back again. we like to welcome those especially who didn't join us for the last two nights. And in case those of you who are new, just to let you know that our speaker is uh, Archbishop Emeritus John Ha from Kuching. He was a lecturer. He taught me in the seminary about 40 over years ago. And uh, he's been giving us very inspiring talk. The first night we had, we talked about reflection and talk about Christ-centeredness, which is something very important, reflecting about it. Last night, we talked about community, which is about renew, and the four pillars, the word, the Eucharist, prayers, and community. So tonight, we welcome him back again uh, to uh, share with us our rejoice, our last day of our tridium today. So we begin with a hymn first. i 
So good evening, everybody. It's good to be back for the last evening of our tribute. And uh, this evening, we will take the third component of the theme. And the third component of the overall theme is rejoice. But we'll do a little bit of recapitulation of what we talked about in the first two evenings. In the first evening, the first component of the overall theme was taken up. And that first component was reflect. And to reflect involves looking back, a looking back into the past, into therefore the uh, history of the parish, the moment it started until now. And when we did that, we were grateful, grateful to those who went ahead of us, our predecessors, for their commitment, for their determination, for their courage to build up that parish. And now we have inherited from them the parish as it stands. And in this reflection, we realized that Christ was there with his Holy Spirit or through his Holy Spirit with our predecessors to empower them, to help them on, to build up that parish to where it is now. And we have inherited that. And so we are grateful to Jesus Christ for the gift of his spirit. So that was the first night. And last night we talked about renew the second element of the overall theme and the idea of a renewal is for us as individuals to grow to grow as christians to grow as disciples of the lord but we are not living in an isolated world all by ourselves we live in a community and therefore when we grow we also want the community to which we belong we want that community to grow, to be alive and to be relevant. And for this, we learn from the past, our strengths and our weaknesses. We build on the past, we build on our strengths and we continue to build. And we learn from our mistakes, the mistakes we made in the past and we try to correct these mistakes, avoid these mistakes, avoid the pitfalls that um, we faced earlier on or in the past. So that now we can have a, very, a strong and relevant community ready to move into the future. And when we want to renew ourselves, we must not forget the four pillars of any Christian community, the word, the word of God that is, the breaking of bread, which is the Eucharist. And it's not just the Eucharist alone. Now that we are in the modern church, we have got the seven sacraments. So we have also the other sacra sacraments to think about. Then prayers, we need to be committed to prayers and we need to live a life of communion or koinonia so that we can together meet the challenges that we face and be relevant. So that's what we did in the first two evenings. And this evening, we move on to the third component of the overall theme, and that is rejoice. And rejoice is a call for joy, a call to burst into joy. And why do we need hope? Oh, why is there such a call for us? Why do we feel that we want to burst into joy? Because we are celebrating the golden jubilee of the parish. And the golden jubilee is beyond an ordinary anniversary. It's beyond the ordinary, therefore. And so there is reason to rejoice. And when we talk about the jubilee, I like to take up the uh, root of a Jubilee celebration. 
and the, the root of the Jubilee celebration is found in the Old Testament. The word Jubilee comes from the Hebrew word Yobel. And Yobel means the horn of a ram. And the horn of a ram was used by the people of Israel to serve as a trumpet. And so it's blown. It's blown to start off the Jubilee year. And that's how the word Jubilee um, emerges from the Hebrew Yobel, the ram's horn, which is used as a trumpet to blow, to be blown to start the Jubilee year. And for the people in the Old Testament, seven is a very important number. It symbolizes totality, completeness, um, perfection to some extent. And the Jubilee year is the 50th year in the Old Testament. And what is 50? 50 is the sum of seven times seven plus one. Therefore, the year immediately following the seven cycles of seven years, that's the Jubilee year. And it is, it is important for the people of Israel to have this year. I'll take this, uh, this point up huh, in these slides that follow. We go to the foundational text in the Old Testament, and that is <clears throat> the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, verses eight to 10. And there, the people of Israel were asked, you are to count seven weeks, a week is seven days, eh? seven weeks of seven years, and therefore seven times seven years, therefore. Eh? And on the 10th day of the seventh month, you shall sound the trumpet throughout the land, you shall declare this 50th year sacred, a jubilee year, a your bell for you. So this jubilee year was a year of joy in the Old Testament. And so the ram's horn was sounded to proclaim this year of joy. And why would it be a year of joy? <clears throat> there are two reasons. The first is all the Jewish slaves would have to be liberated. And we have that in the book of Leviticus. You will declare this 50th year sacred and proclaim the liberation of all the inhabitants of the land. Liberation of all the inhabitants of the land, especially those who have been made to serve as slaves. This is to be a jubilee year for you. And each one will return to his ancestral home. You, re you return to your homeland and your homeland would be the land which your tribe possesses. You know, when the people of Israel um, they were given the, the uh, promised land. The promised land was divided into territories and each tribe, except the tribe of Levi, each tribe was given a particular territory. So go back to your ancestral home. And the second reason, all lost property would have to be restored to the original owner or his family. And what would that lost property refer to? The text. In the Jubilee year, it, it referring to the property that was lost because it was sold, the family had no money, so they would have to sell the property in order to have money for whatever the needs are or were. So in that Jubilee year, whatever was sold of the land, the lost property must be released and return to the original owner. And that's why the Jubilee year was celebrated in great joy with the blowing of the ram's horn. <clears throat> What's the significance of this? <clears throat> the significance is the slave is liberated. 
the lost property is restored. It is, it amounts to the restoration of the dignity and rights of all who had lost their dignity when they became slaves and their rights when they sold their property. So it's a restoration of that dignity and the rights that they had. And Yahweh commanded, God commanded this with this reason given. Fear your God. Fear in the Old Testament does not so much express the, the sentiment, the emotion of being afraid. Rather, it expresses obey your God. Obey your God. I am Yahweh, your God. That's the reason. You do all this because I am Yahweh and I command it. Full stop. So the reason is Yahweh himself. And what's the idea behind all this? Yahweh was the God of the people of Israel, chosen by him to be his own people in the covenant. So here, what was at stake was the covenantal relationship. So becoming a slave would mean now I cannot enjoy, I cannot enjoy the covenant relationship anymore. Losing property would mean I'm losing part of what I should have as a member of the covenanted people. So restoration of the dignity and rights in obedience to what Yahweh had commanded, simply because he was their God, that would be a restoration of covenantal relationship. So the God-people relationship would be restored to all these people who are liberated from slavery, to all these people to whom their lost property had been restored. So underlying all that in the celebration of the Jubilee year was the covenantal relationship, God-people relationship. It's very fundamental to the people of Israel because all of them were members of these covenantal people of God. You are my people, I will be your God. And therefore, in the Jubilee year, the restoration would mean you are given an opportunity to start living the covenantal life again. This was important for them. So we have to bear this in mind as we celebrate the Jubilee year. The Jubilee year, therefore, is very sacred. It's very solemn. And that's why the Yobel, the uh, Shofar Yobel, the ram's horn was blown, was blown as the, trump, uh, the trumpet to start of this Jubilee year. There was an atmosphere of solemnity and also an atmosphere of joy because the covenantal relationship now is restored to those who have lost it. And we apply this to the parish. It's the same solemnity. It's the same joy. The reason for the Jubilee year in the Old Testament is fear Yahweh, for I am Yahweh, your God. The divine, the divine entity, the divine presence amongst the people of God. That was the reason for the Jubilee year. The reason for liberation, the reason for restoration of rights, lost rights. It's the same divine presence through the Holy Spirit that we have experienced as we celebrate the golden jubilee of the parish. And that divine presence through the Holy Spirit has seen the parish, has seen all of us in the parish through the ups and downs of our history. At certain times, we were really high. We really did very well. On some other occasions, we were just hitting rock bottom. <clears throat> but God was there. And that's why we have survived. And not just survived, we are thriving in what we are today. And therefore, <clears throat> 
The Jubilee year is a time of grace, what we call in, um, in Greek, the kairos. There are two words for time <coughs> in Greek. One is chronos. Chronos is the time that we have. Three o'clock now, five o'clock later on, to now it's night, tomorrow we get up, it's morning, that kind of time. Chronology, eh? chronos. The other time is kairos, the time of grace. We shall see later on. This time of grace <coughs> is not divided into sections, four o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock at night. No, this time of grace is continuous. We shall see that later on. <coughs> so when we reflect, and in the first evening, we reflected, we took stock. We took stock of what went on before. We evaluated, and I mentioned, we evaluated not to criticize our predecessors, but rather to see the strengths and the weaknesses of the parish so that we can grow, to be aware of fidelity, the fidelity of our predecessors, and also to discover where they had gone astray, very likely not through their own desire to go astray, but because of a, a lot of factors, perhaps that they couldn't see, but we're learning from this, taking stock to evaluate. And then from there, we said, okay, now we need to change. And when we say we want to change, we do not discard the past altogether as if it didn't exist. When we want to change, we want to build ourselves up and we can build ourselves up only on what we have received, the legacy that we have received. And we want to return to the Lord. And that would mean we want to restore relationship with him that has been damaged. And that's part of the idea of renewal. I talked about growth and conversion. There would be no growth without conversion. So here we want to convert, we want to turn back to the Lord so that whatever relationship we had with him that was damaged would be restored and we can move on, we can grow. So we have reason to rejoice given this time of grace, the Kairos, in the Golden Jubilee that we are celebrating now, we have reason to blow the ram's horn, the shofar, your bell, and to rejoice. To blow the ram's horn, not to blow our trump trumpet, like in Mandarin they say, Chui La Pa, to boast, to boast of our achievement, no. St. Paul says, if I want to boast, I must boast in the Lord. So it is to proclaim the Lord's grace working in our parish. So that this golden jubilee is a time of grace, God's grace. And so it is an occasion of joy. The joy that we experience now is tied to a new start. And we take our cue from the Old Testament Jubilee. The liberation of the slaves and the restoration of lost property amounted to a, re, a reinstatement of the covenantal relationship. The person who had become a slave, the person who had lost his property, now, that person would now be made again a full member or he could enjoy full membership in the covenant uh, relationship with God. Not that he had lost the membership, no. Once he was made a member of the covenant, he could never lose that membership. But what he lost or she lost was that 
experience that enjoyment of that membership, he or she lost the freedom. Therefore, he or she lost um, that uh, privilege of being a member of the covenant community. He or she lost some property. That property actually would be the property within the, the territory of the tribe to which he or she belonged. And so she couldn't enjoy or he couldn't enjoy covenantal membership to the full. So now there is a restoration of all that. And the response <clears throat> now for us in the parish, having taken the cue from the Old Testament, what is our response as we celebrate the parish Golden Jubilee? <clears throat> of course, it's a joyful celebration. Uh, just right at the beginning before we started, uh, we had a glimpse of um, the souvenir magazine. It's all so nice. But we want, the souvenir magazine is a, a, a way of looking back, and of, a way of reflecting, but we want to have a new start. We want to renew ourselves. So that response to the joy that we experience in this golden jubilee of the parish should spur us on, should fire us up with a great desire to renew ourselves, to recommit our part in the life, ministry, and mission of the parish, to recommit myself to take part, to play my part in the life, ministry, and mission of the parish with the realization that I'm not alone, that I have other parishioners with me, but more importantly, that God is always there through his Holy Spirit to accompany us, to empower us. And therefore, there is a call, a call for collaboration. We cannot leave Father Edward Lim to work alone. We have to collaborate with him. And we have the church leaders, the lay leaders who are there helping Father Lim to look after the spiritual uh, and pastoral needs of our, of our people. But we need, oh, we need to play our part. We need to contribute our share of work to work together with the parish priests and the lay leaders of the parish in order to look after the spiritual and pastoral needs of our fellow parishioners. Plus, on the top of that, to do an outreach, to reach out to people who are outside our community, who are outside our church, people who are in need, so that we can proclaim Christ to them. Not proclaim Christ to them in, a, in an arrogant way, no, through our, our heart of love, the love that we talk about um, coming from the koinonia. And we have the assurance of this divine presence. Christ and his spirit are always there. Or Christ is always present with us through his Holy Spirit to empower us to move on, to grow. And we saw that uh, promise that Christ made of the Holy Spirit in the farewell discourse. And that the farewell discourse of Jesus is given in John's Gospel, chapter 14. 15 and 16. And the promise, we saw this text last night, I will ask the Father, Christ saying, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth. The spirit is Christ's new presence, is Christ's permanent presence with us. And when we have the spirit, then we enjoy the fruits of the Spirit. And one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is joy. St. Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, lists out the fruits of the Spirit. And joy is one of them. What the Spirit brings is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustfulness, 
gentleness, and self-control. We are assured of the Holy Spirit's presence. We are assured of his help. And in this experience of his presence and his help, we surely have joy. And that joy is a Christian joy. It is Christian. It is a Christian joy because it is tied to Christ. Christian, that's the word that comes from Christ, the name Christ. So the joy as a fruit of the Holy Spirit is rooted in Christ and it, it revolves around Christ. And it can be experienced only with the Holy Spirit, who is Christ's new presence with us. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to go through with you this concept of joy. <clears throat> this concept of joy, especially in Luke's gospel. Luke's gospel has joy as a very important theme. Of course, all the, all the writings of the New Testament contain joy. And the other gospels, the other three gospels, uh, uh, Matthew, Mark, and John, they also have texts that present joy. But Luke has joy as a prominent theme. And he has a way of um, presenting this joy that is not found in the other three gospels. And I'd like to go through uh, a few texts with you uh, from Luke's gospel. And this is to enlighten us on the kind of joy that we should have as we rejoice while celebrating the golden jubilee. So the first um, chapters are Luke 1 and 2. We know these stories inside chapters 1 and 2 of Luke's gospel very well because they, they are stories about the birth of John the Baptist, the birth of Jesus. And the birth stories, both of them, uh, they are preceded by an announcement uh, announcement by the angel Gabriel to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, and to our blessed mother, the birth of Jesus. John the Baptist and Jesus, of course, are very important figures. And so their births are also very important. Their births are occasions of grace. And therefore, their births bring joy. And the announcements of their birds also bring joy. Now, John, the, or rather, the angel Gabriel went to Zechariah to announce to Zechariah, you will have a son and you must name him John. Zechariah and Elizabeth were very old and they were childless. So they were very old when the angel Gabriel appeared to Zechariah to make that announcement, you will have a son and you must name him John. Now that went beyond human possibility, but God, for God, everything is possible. And so the birth of John the Baptist was announced to Zechariah. And of course it brought joy. It brought joy to Elizabeth. Mary was also approached by angel Gabriel Rejoice, highly favored. You will conceive and bear a son. It's all the work of the Holy Spirit. That was the announcement. And after the Annunciation, Mary immediately got up to go and visit Elizabeth because when the angel Gabriel announced to Mary, you will conceive and bear a son and you must name him Jesus, the angel Gabriel also told her, your relative Elizabeth is now in her six months of pregnancy. So Mary immediately set out to go and visit Elizabeth. And we find this in Luke's gospel, chapter 1, verses 39 to 46, not uh, 56, I think, not for, uh, 36. Eh? Okay. <clears throat> So now as soon as Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. The moment Elizabeth saw Mary, 
this was what happened. The child left in her womb. And note, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And Elizabeth, when she shared how she felt, what she felt inside her womb with Mary, she said this, the child in my womb leapt for joy. She was filled with the Holy Spirit. The child leapt for joy. And that would mean that joy came from the Holy Spirit. The child himself in the womb of Elizabeth was also filled with the Holy Spirit. And there was joy. And it, it would also mean that Elizabeth, when she was filled with the Holy Spirit, she experienced joy as well. And having heard Elizabeth's sharing, Mary burst into her Magnificat, the song of joy. So there was joy all around. The announcements of the story of the birth of John the Baptist and Jesus, and also the birds themselves. And now the, the visit of, May, of um, Elizabeth by Mary. Now the birth of John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1, verses 37 to 38. Meanwhile, the time came for Elizabeth to have her child and she gave birth to a son. And when her neighbors and relations heard that, the, heard that the Lord had shown her so great a kindness, they shared her joy. So Elizabeth was filled with joy and her neighbors, her relations shared her joy. They too were filled with joy. And that joy here for Elizabeth was tied to the gift of a son. She and her husband Zechariah they were childless and they had reached old age. To have a son then, that surely filled them with joy. Plus, in the biblical days, um, the birth of a child would be seen as a blessing from the Lord. Barrenness was seen as a curse. And therefore, having John the Baptist as a son broke that humiliation that Elizabeth had been suffering from for so many years that brought her joy. But on the top of that, and in fact, the most important reason for that joy was that John, the son of Elizabeth, was to be the precursor of Jesus, the forerunner of Jesus. He would be the one sent ahead of Jesus to prepare the hearts of people for the coming of Jesus. That was God's plan. And the birth of John the Baptist to Elizabeth was God's plan. And God had a plan for John. And that brought Elizabeth great joy. I'm sure it brought Zechariah great joy as well. Only thing it is not recorded in, the, uh, in Luke's gospel. So Mary's Elizabeth, sorry, Mary. Mary's visit to Elizabeth, sorry, again in uh, the, the verses are given wrongly again. I don't know why I repeated that. I must have been sleeping, but never mind. The Holy Spirit now brought joy to Elizabeth and brought joy to the son in her womb in this great encounter between two great women, Elizabeth and Mary. And it wasn't just an encounter between the two great women. It was an encounter primarily with Jesus in the womb of Mary. So Elizabeth and the son in her womb encountered Jesus in the womb of Mary. And that was the reason for that joy, the encounter with Jesus. And that encounter with Jesus, or rather the recognition of Jesus in the womb of Mary, came from the Holy Spirit. So that joy was Christian in that it was rooted and it revolved around an encounter with Jesus and the recognition of Jesus in the womb of Mary 
came from the Holy Spirit. And that's the joy that Elizabeth experienced and John experienced and also Mary experienced. Now we have the birth story of Jesus. In Luke chapter two, verses one to 20, that was announced to Mary in chapter one, verses 26 to 38. Note the words of angel Gabriel to Mary. Rejoice so highly favored. The Lord is with you. You are to conceive and bear a son, and you must name him Jesus. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. What do we have there? Again, it is Jesus. Jesus at the heart of the joy that the angel Gabriel pronounced on Mary. And that joy that was centered and revolved around Jesus came from the Holy Spirit. Jesus was conceived by Mary through the power of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, it's by the power of the Spirit, of course, by God's choice, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, that Mary, the Virgin Mary, was able to conceive and bear Jesus, was able to be the mother of Jesus. And when Jesus was born then, there were shepherds in the, in the fields watching their flocks by night. And the angel went to the shepherds to announce this. I've come to bring news of great joy, a joy to be shared by the whole people. That great news of great joy, that joy was tied to the birth of Jesus. It was therefore tied to Jesus, rooted in Jesus, and revolved around Jesus. And the uh, angel continues, today, and I put today in yellow, will, um, this will uh, become clearer and clearer as we go on. Today, in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Now this was at night, the, the uh, shepherds were taking turns uh, to watch their flocks by night. And the angel appeared to them at night, but he still said, today. There is a significance in that word today. We shall see that later. But right now, I just point that out. And the joy comes from, or is rooted in the fact that in the town of David, Christ the Lord, your savior, has been born, Christ the Lord. Without that Christ, there would be no joy or the joy wouldn't be the same. So the birth of Jesus gives joy because he is not just an ordinary man. He is Christ the Lord. And it takes place today. Not the title, Christ the Lord. Christ or Jesus is the Son of God. <clears throat> when, he, when Angel Gabriel announced to Mary the birth of Jesus, the angel qualified Jesus as the Son of God. And therefore, his Lord in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. But Jesus is also the Christ. And what does that term, what does that title, Christ, mean it means the one who is anointed christos is the greek translation for the hebrew word messiah the one who is anointed and isaiah prophesies that anointed one in isaiah chapter 61 verse 1 and verse 2 um the text will be treated later when jesus um read from isaiah chapter 61 eh? It's asserted in this teaching of Jesus in the synagogue in Nazareth during a Sabbath day service. Jesus was the one who presided the service. So he read from Isaiah. And what did he read? 
the spirit of the Lord has been given to me. For he has anointed me. He has sent me to bring the good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to captives and to the blind new sight, to set the downtrodden free, to proclaim the Lord's year of favor. Jesus continues. After reading from the, uh, from the scroll of Isaiah, he rolled the scroll back, he gave it to the attendant, and then he said, this text is being fulfilled today, even as you listen. By these words, Jesus claims that he is the fulfillment of the anointed one that Isaiah prophesied. Jesus is the Christ, the one anointed with the Spirit, and he was sent to liberate humankind from sin and, of course, from eternal death and primarily from captivity in the hands of Satan and his forces. And that's the year of the Lord's favor. I go back to the text <clears throat> right at the, uh, the bottom there, to proclaim the Lord's year of favor. So the coming of Jesus in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy was also to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that's the Jubilee year. For Isaiah, that the year of the Lord's favor was the year of liberation from slavery and restoration to covenantal relationship corresponding to the Jubilee year. The year of the Lord's favor then would correspond to the Jubilee year. And in Luke's gospel, Jesus Christ, the Lord, comes with his power to liberate us from captivity, from Satan's hold, and to restore us to relationship with God, his Father. And Jesus fulfills that prophecy made by Isaiah. And he has come to bring the Lord's favor to fulfillment. The Lord's favor, our liberation, and our restoration. So the Jubilee year is the year of our liberation from sin, from captivity in the hands of Satan, and restoration as God's children. And surely this brings us joy. And that joy is a Christian joy because it is brought about by Christ. And he's the one anointed with the Holy Spirit and sent by his Father into our world to bring eternal life to all of us, to bring liberation and to restore us, to, um, and to, to restore the divine childhood that we lost because of our sin, to restore that to us. So that's one uh, section of Luke's Gospel that talks about joy. And now I would like to take up two other episodes from Luke's gospel, the episode about Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. Jesus was there, Zacchaeus, oh, rich man. I, I just imagine him to be a short man, plump, because he's so rich, uh, maybe plump to obesity. And you just imagine this rich man, plump, fat, running, running to climb a sycamore tree I don't know how a sycamore tree looks like, but this, the imagination itself is enough to make you laugh. This, you know, uh, very uh, fat man running clumsily and climbing a tree, and surely everybody would be looking at him because of his wealth, he must have been very uh, well known. So think about that. And he did all that. And then Jesus saw him there and Jesus said, today, Again, uh, today, salvation has come to this house, this house, the house of Zacchaeus. For the Son of Man has come to seek out and to save what was lost. What was this salvation? It's to seek out. To seek out is to liberate. You have been captured. And the Son of Man comes looking for you. He has found you and he, then he breaks your bonds. You are liberated. 
because you have given yourself to Satan to be a slave, now you have been liberated, you will be restored to relationship with God again. And so that's salvation. And that takes place today. Salvation has come to this house today. And what was Zacchaeus' decision? I'm going to give half my property to the poor. <clears throat> That's a lot, considering how wealthy he was. And if I have cheated anybody, I will pay him back four times the amount. <clears throat> What's that? That's conversion. The experience of the salvation coming from Christ leads to conversion. And conversion is necessary for growth. And so this encounter with Jesus brings joy to Zacchaeus. That's why he made a very radical decision to convert, to give half his property to the poor and to restore whatever he has uh, cheated people off. That's real conversion. And it brings joy to him. Not tomorrow, today, we shall see. Huh? <clears throat> Then there is this famous episode of the repentant criminal in Luke chapter 23, verses 37 to 43. Now, hanging on the cross with Jesus were two criminals, one on the right, one on the left. One mocked Jesus, the other rebuked the one who mocked Jesus, and then turned to Jesus in prayer. Jesus Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what was Jesus' re response? I assure you, today, not tomorrow, today, you will be with me in paradise. The assurance given by Jesus, and it is not just empty words. Whatever comes from the mouth of Jesus is true. It's a reality. Now, put ourselves in the shoes of this repentant criminal. He had gone to rock bottom of his life. He was crucified. There was nothing that he could do. He was just going to lose his life. It was at this point of experiencing rock bottom that made him turn to Jesus. Like Jesus on the cross, we saw it last night crying out to his father, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? This criminal turned to Jesus. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He turned to Jesus for liberation and for restoration. To be allowed entry into paradise so that he could start anew. He could have a new life. And that is the year of the Lord's favor, the Jubilee. And that's the joy today. Now we come to the word today. So today is found in the angel's message to the shepherds, the good news. Today in the city of David, a savior has been born to you, Christ the Lord. Today is found in the, the words of Jesus, the proclamation of Jesus when, uh, in the, during the uh, Sabbath day service in the synagogue in Nazareth. He read from prophet, uh, the prophet Isaiah and he said, today, what you have heard is being fulfilled. Today is also in the words of Jesus to Zacchaeus. And now today, is in the words of Jesus, assuring the repentant criminal, today you will be with me in paradise. And that means salvation is a reality now, now itself, for all of us, it's a kairos, now is a kairos. And that now is ongoing. Now I hear the words of Jesus saying to me, today, 
Tomorrow, when I read the scriptures, when I pray, I still hear the same words of Jesus using this word, today. Ten years time, I still hear the words of Jesus, it's today. This now is ongoing. It's never broken. It's the ongoing now. And that ongoing now is the year, the time of the Lord's favor. It is the kairos. Now, the ongoing now is the kairos of God for all of us. And so we have joy. And when we celebrate the Jubilee, it's just to, to be more conscious of the joy that we experience because of the Lord Jesus being present with us through his spirit. That joy is a constant experience of ours, but on an occasion like the Jubilee of the parish, that's an occasion for us to be more conscious, more aware of it, and therefore be more thankful to the Lord. So every day, every moment, every hour is today. It is the day of Christian joy. And it is an ongoing moment, an ongoing hour. The Kairos is just ongoing. Then we have the Apostles' joy in uh, Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 53. See, the Apostles uh, witnessed Jesus ascending to heaven. But before Jesus ascended to heaven, he told them, now you go back to Jerusalem and wait for the Father's promise. And the Father's promise was the promise of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus ascended to heaven and the disciples returned to, uh, to uh, Jerusalem. They had joy. But even before that, when Jesus, the risen Christ, appeared to them, they already experienced this joy even before the coming of the Spirit on Pentecost. They experienced this joy and this joy was so great when Jesus appeared to them, that they still could not believe that it was Jesus standing in front of them. And they stood there dumbfounded. So with that experience, after Jesus has, had ascended to, uh, to heaven, they returned to Jerusalem full of joy because Jesus said, I will give you the spirit. I will ask the Father to send you another advocate to be with you forever. That's the Father's promise, uttered by Jesus, of course. And the disciples went back to Jerusalem with a great confidence that that promise would be fulfilled. And so they returned to Jerusalem full of joy. The cause of the joy of the apostles was, of course, the sight of the risen Lord. The risen Lord appeared to them and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's the year of the Lord's favor. And it is now a reality that ongoing now, that today. And so the resurrection of the Lord assures our liberation and the gift of the Holy Spirit brings about restoration. We are liberated by Jesus through his death and resurrection and given life. And the Holy Spirit is given to us and we are made children of God. And we, we talk about this, um, you know, at our baptism, we become children of God because when we were baptized, the Holy Spirit comes down of our, uh, to us and uh, we are baptized in the name of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are made children of God. We are restored or the, the divine childhood, which our sins have made us lose. Now that divine childhood is restored to us. And that's the liberation. That's the restoration, and that's the jubilee year that we talk about. It's a year of grace. The kairos is today, it's the ongoing now, and so the joy is also ongoing. So Christian joy then means, or oh, it, it conveys that happiness that we have, that happiness that comes from an experience of our liberation from sin, and our restoration to good relationship with God and with one another.
today, now, and it's brought about by Jesus Christ and sustained by the Holy Spirit. And that's the joy of our golden jubilee. The celebration of our golden jubilee gives us this joy because we have experienced Christ's salvation and that experience is made possible for us through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit makes that possible in the proclamation of God's word and in our fidelity to God's word. And we experience that joy, that liberation also in our celebration of the Eucharist and the sacraments, again, made possible by the Holy Spirit. And when we have experienced that liberation, we want to continue that in that relationship with God. So that leads us to prayers, personal prayers, family prayers, uh, small Christian community group prayers, parish prayers, parish worship, and the koinonia, which is a communion of love and service manifesting or manifesting uh, are manifesting the unity of the parish, rather. So we have joy because the parish is alive. That's why we have 50 years of, you know, a celebration of 50 years of this parish. So we rejoice. Christ is in the parish. He is present there through his spirit. And the spirit empowers the parish to survive, to thrive, to grow until today when it can ce celebrate its 50th year and is still very much alive. And our joy spurs us on to move into the future. And to do that, we do not have to invent the wheel we have only to build on the legacy that we have inherited from our predecessors with gratitude so that we can live our present with confidence and forge ahead into the future with hope. We move on, but where do we move? In what direction do we move? What is our goal? It's the kingdom of God. That's our goal. And the kingdom of God is our final and real home where there is eternal life. And that eternal life is a sharing in God's own life. And when we share in God's own life, we are truly God's children. That's our goal. And the kingdom is, in Jesus' words, my father's house. There are many rooms in my father's house. I'm going now to prepare you a place. And after I prepared you a place, I shall return to take you with me so that where I am, you may be too. Jesus is present with us through his spirit now. He wants us to be present with him in his father's house. What a wonderful um, grace that is. We don't deserve that. But Jesus offers this to us and he himself prepares a room for each one of us. And so our goal is our father's home. And that goal is also the source of our joy. And we have one episode in Luke's gospel about the 72 disciples being sent out by Jesus and they went out and they did marvelous work, very successful. And they came to, they came back and they reported to Jesus, Lord, even the devil submit to us when we use your name. Oh, great power, great success. What was Jesus' response? Yes, I watched Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Yet do not rejoice that the spirit submit to you. Rejoice rather that your names are written in heaven. Don't go for the wrong joy. Success 
is what they were rejoicing about. But Jesus said, no, the kingdom of God, that's what should give you joy. So the response of Jesus is, you rejoice not because of success, but because of entry. Your names are written in God's kingdom. And this is exactly what Mother Teresa told don't know, her sisters or told the world or told uh, listeners who are listening to, to her. Do not look for success, but be faithful. Be faithful. Success, yes, it gives us joy, but that joy is transient, it's temporary. It will go. But the joy that comes from our names being written in God's kingdom, that stays. In heaven, in the Father's house, we have full liberation. We have full and sure restoration. Restoration to our status as God's children in the eternal presence of God. Therefore, in joy, we are now journeying towards the kingdom of God as a community, the community made up of families and each family is a domestic church. The community made up of neighborhood um, communities, basic ecclesial communities, and the community being in the parish. We are all journeying together. And in that journey, we have Christ with us through the spirit. This is, we are sure of this because he has made that promise. He has given us that assurance and also we have experienced it. So the golden jubilee becomes Kairos, the time of grace today, that ongoing now filled with joy so that now we are ready to renew after reflecting on our past, to renew ourselves, to renew our community, and we are willing to move ahead together. Always bearing in mind that we have to be faithful to God's word, that we have to break bread. To break bread means to celebrate the Eucharist but not just the Eucharist, but also the sacraments. We have to pray and we have to be in communion with one another, for sure. As we celebrate the Golden Jubilee with joy and gratitude to the Lord, we want to continue to experience the Father's grace, the Kairos, the loving presence of Jesus in our midst through his Holy Spirit. It is only then that we are true Christians in a true church. It is only then that we are on the right path in our pilgrimage to our true home, the kingdom of God. Even as we journey on, we experience the today of our salvation, that ongoing now of the Kairos. We experience our liberation and our restoration so that the jubilee year, the golden jubilee of the parish is in fact also the year of the Lord's favor. This is our faith and this is our hope. It is also our prayer of joy and gratitude, our song of praise. And so we pray, Lord, we glorify you. As we celebrate our golden jubilee, bless us and bring us to your kingdom. And there's no other way to proclaim this praise to God, to sing our Alleluia. There's no better way in this Zoom Tridome than to join in with the congregation, our own congregation, at one Easter celebration, singing the Easter song. And here we are.
Okay, uh, thank you so very much. Um, I hope that uh, the three evenings of talks do make some sense to you. And um, I'm very happy to have been invited by Father Edward to be part of this celebration. And I thank Father Edward and his committee for inviting me. Thank you and God bless. So thank you, Your Grace. Uh, thank you for giving time to us. We are very honored to listen to you. And I'm sure with the three nights, we have learned a lot of things, uh, things that are very inspiring to help us to celebrate our Jubilee tomorrow onwards. Tomorrow is actually our actual day of our celebration. Uh, the church was officially opened on the 3rd of July. So it happens that tomorrow is Saturday. It's also is something very good. And so thank you. I'm sure all of us who have gone through uh, or listened to you for these three days have benefited today. And our Jubilee for this church, especially the Church of the Risen Christ, will have something very meaningful, learning from you and the joy that, that we are going to experience, what way it comes about or how it comes about the importance of the Eucharist and the Word and the pillars of the, of the community, all are important. So thank you, Grace. We hope to maybe see you someday again to invite you to give us talk. I'm sure a lot of people will also be eagerly, eagerly looking to look forward to be with you or to hear from you because uh, I've heard that uh, it is good in a sense that uh, you are local, Malaysia and Singapore, you are about the same. So you are able to share with us our situations and things that is happening. So thank you very much, Your Grace. And we give a big hand. <laughs> my joy. My joy, Father Edward. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. God bless everybody. Okay. Good night. And then good night. Good night yes. perish. Those of you, uh, like I said, uh, magazines will be distributed. If you cannot come for mass, don't worry. Just uh, during the weekday, 10 to 12, or if you come on Sunday, uh, before mass, you can collect the magazines, uh, the souvenir, the rosary, and also the holy water. I'm sure we have more than enough for, for everyone. Okay, so good night and God bless. God bless. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Happy anniversary, everyone. Happy anniversary, recent Christ. Good night. Happy anniversary, God bless. Hi. Hello. Good night. Happy celebration. Hello. <laughs> <laughs>